Good morning, everybody. Um, here's the attendance. Oops, that's not the attendance. That's something else that was copying and pasting. Here's the attendance, as well as a link to the um, tutoring that I mentioned a few times. So if you're looking for tutoring help, you can always go there and get it. Um, Sanders has continued to go on and on and talk about uh, linearization, I think, and Newton's method, which are always things I would prefer to skip if I could. But while well, linearizations are important, Newton's method is less so. And I imagine you guys might not really be ready to talk about that stuff yet. I would assume you guys probably have homework questions. So you can certainly look at some problems similar to the homework if you would like to. Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, last, last class we covered essentially problems one through four. Yeah, we did. Yeah. So we could certainly do, we could do more different, um, well, uh, not different equations, we could do more uh, related rates if you guys would like. I've definitely got some related rates examples ready to go. Or we could look at some of the other questions about exponential growth and the inverse function and derivative theorem. What do you guys want? There's the attendance again. Homework problems sure but like which one should we look at? Should we look at more differential equations? Or sorry, God, you saying differential equations. Should we look at more related rates? You know what? Actually, we should look at more related rates, even if you guys don't want to. We should, because related rates, ooh, geez, all right. I'm off. Sorry. So let's look at some related rates questions, and then we can look at some other homework questions too. Let's see where So let's look at a couple related rates problems here. So, sure. so let's let's do this one. A plane flies, probably not high school flies. And uh, let's say a toy plane flies at an altitude. Of 300 feet at a speed of, well, I don't know, let's say 60 feet per second. So probably pretty fast, whatever. I'm 60, now let's say 50. Eight seconds after the plane flies directly overhead, how fast is the distance from me? Plane changing. Okay, so um, let me sorry, let me pull my screen here. I know it doesn't make a difference to you guys, but it makes a difference to me. Let's see here. Okay, so plane flies overhead. So we should draw a picture, right? Whenever you see a problem like this where it's more complicated than just like a circle or a square that's getting bigger or smaller, you should draw a picture. So here I am, standing right here. We've got this plane that's flying overhead, and the plane is at a constant height of 300 feet. So the plane's like moving along like this. And at some point, right later on, the plane's over here. All right, so there's our plane. And we're asking how fast is the distance from me to the plane increasing? So we should try to label the things we know in this picture, specifically things that are changing and things that are, oh yeah, I'm sorry. There's the link. Thank you, Al. Good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to call 
this distance 300, right? Because it's not changing, right? The plane is always flying at the same height. This distance here, the distance from directly over my head to where the plane is, is increasing, right? It's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So I'm going to call this x. And this distance from me to the plane is also increasing. I'm going to call it s. It's fairly typical to use s for a diagonal distance. I don't actually know why, but it is. So there is our picture, right? x is increasing and s is increasing. And this height is staying constant. And now we're going to set up our usual setup for a related rates problem. So there are kind of, if you count this as the first step, there's five steps. There's four steps after drawing the picture. The first step. What's changing? Well, we already kind of had to figure that out when we drew the picture, right? When I was drawing the picture, I was like, oh, I know that this is changing, so I labeled it with a variable. I knew that this was changing. So I know that x is changing. And we know that x is changing at a rate of dx dt. And that's just how fast this length is increasing. Well, this length is increasing at the speed that the plane is moving at. It's increasing at 50 feet per second. And we want to know how fast S is increasing, but we don't. That's DSET. So we're interested to know what that is. OK, so then the second thing we need to do is we need to find an equation relating the variables that are changing, X and S. So can anyone think of an equation relating X and S that has to do with maybe having a right triangle. There's the attendance link and the tutoring link again, by the way. Everybody's favorite triangle type equation. Starts with a P and does the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> right, we've got x squared plus 300 squared equals s squared. And we're going to run out of room, so let's go to the other side of things. So after we get the equation relating the variables, we're going to take the derivative of both sides. But we're going to differentiate with respect to time. And we are always under the assumption in these related race problems that every fun everything here is a function of time, right? Because x is changing as time is increasing, and s is changing as time is increasing. So as time goes on, these things change. So when I take the derivative of x squared, I don't just get 2x, I get 2x times dx dt. And I'm going to leave this alone for a second. When I take the derivative of s squared, I get 2s times ds dt. Let me ask you guys, what's the derivative of 300 squared? Yeah, thanks. Don't get fooled, right? Sometimes, sometimes people write like something like, you know, I see people write like the, what's the derivative of like e to the fourth? And people will say it's e to the fourth, but the derivative of e to the fourth is zero because it's also a constant. So then we're gonna solve for what we want to solve for. So I have two x times dx, I don't know why I'm writing this again dx dt equal to 2s. Oh, I know why I was right. Well, not really. I'm going to pretend like I'm right. I can divide both sides by 2. And so that's kind of a bit easier. But then I have to plug in what I know. So let's see. So I know that dx dt is 50. So that's going to be 50 feet per second. And I'm trying to figure out what ds dt is. Right, that's the, that should be my unknown. But x and s should be things I can know or figure out. So let's go back and read the problem. Plane flies at an altitude of 300 feet at a speed of 50 feet per second. Eight seconds after the plane flies directly overhead. So right, this is eight seconds after being right here. In eight seconds, the plane can go 50 feet per second. And 50 feet per second times eight seconds is 400 feet. So we know that eight seconds later, right, eight seconds, this is going to be a 400 foot length. So x is going to be 400 feet. And s, well, I'm going to just draw this little picture over here, right? If the height's 300 
and this length is 400, how long is this hypotenuse of my, of my right triangle? Any guesses? Yeah, and I think the way Elsie is getting that, I, I don't imagine Elsie actually did 300 square plus 400 squared into the square root. She recognized that, oh, we really just have a three, four, five, Pythagorean triple, and then multiplied every side by 100 and said, oh, that's the same time we have 300, 400, 500 Pythagorean triple. By the way, when you're dealing with right triangles in these types of problems, this kind of thing comes up a lot. So if you do like 300, 400, 500, or 60, 80, 100, those kinds of triangles often show up. So then we're just going to solve for this. DSDT. I'm really, I, should, I guess I should write 400 feet. 500 feet. I'm going to divide by 500 and then we get 400 feet times 50 feet per second over 500 feet. So the feet will cancel and we'll just get feet per second. And then I cancel a 5, a 5, a 0, a 0, a 0, a 0. I get 4 times 0, which is 40 feet per second. So at that particular moment, that's how fast the distance between me and the plane is increasing. Later on, it would be either bigger or slower or, or smaller. Probably smaller. All right, are there questions about that? Should we do another related rate? Oh, can you go back to the answer? Of course. Well, maybe. <laughs> um, so, uh, so we got so we took the derivative of both sides, right? So here's the derivative of both sides. Derivative of x squared is two x dx dt. Derivative of s squared is two s dx dt. We canceled the two, so we divided both sides by two, and then we just plugged in everything we knew. So we knew dx dt was fifty feet per second. We knew x. We figured out that x was forty feet. Sorry, four hundred feet by plugging in. Time well, thinking about if it's eight seconds later, it's going to be 40 feet further. And then we figured out if this was 400 feet and this was 300 feet, that this had to be 500 feet. So S was 500 feet. And then we divided the size by 500. So I got 400 times 50 divided by 500. A 5 canceled, a 0 canceled, like a 10 canceled, a 10 canceled, that's up to 4 times 10, so 40 feet per second. One thing to keep in mind about this, which I always kind of think about, is it wouldn't make sense for this number to be bigger than 50 feet per second, right? If I'm moving in this direction, 50 feet per second, that's the fastest I could be moving away from this guy, right? But really, I'm not, my, right, from here to here, that distance isn't increasing at quite the same speed because I'm not moving in that direction, I'm moving in that direction. So when, however fast something is moving, it can't be moving faster than that away from something that's not like on a straight line from it. So. Definitely makes sense that there was a lesser rate of change. Um, other questions about this? Also, here is the attendance and tutoring again. All right. Can we talk about Arctan? Sure, for sure. I'm assuming, so let me see. Yeah, I mean, yes, I'm just trying to. So, has he talked about the derivative of the inverse tangent? Okay. So, okay, we need to talk about this. So, I'm guessing he probably did it in the following way. I haven't actually, I've been watch, I haven't been watching his lecture lately. I've just been kind of reading the notes and like, okay, he covered this. Um, so, let me talk about how, so, here, so here's what you probably need to memorize. If your function f of x is equal to the arc tangent of x, um, that's one way of writing. It's my preferred way of writing it, but it's also equally valid to write it as the inverse tangent of x. Both of those mean the same thing. Um, and so what they mean, it, well, I should say, first of all, this is probably not the first of all part, but this is what eventually you know. I'm assuming he has gotten to saying the derivative of our tangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Has he said that? Have you guys seen that? Okay, which I figured. 
you're definitely going to want to memorize that. It's going to come up enough that you need to know it. Um, I should also kind of just, no, we'll talk about it. Okay, so, so great. So here's what I'm imagining he did in class. To find the derivative of the inverse tangent, he probably did something like this. He probably said, well, we have this cap, yeah, this is a pain. Um, so let, let me back up for one second. So just so everybody knows how our tangent works, right? I know that tangent of pi over four is equal to one. And I know that tangent of pi over three is equal to root three. I know that tangent of pi over six is equal to one over root three. Or if you prefer, root three over three. And the reason I'm saying these things is because the inverse tangent is the inverse function, right? So if I have a tangent of something equals something, I know the inverse tangent of one is pi over four. Because the inverse tangent exactly undoes what the tangent does. And you can write it this way, or you could say the arc tangent, right? same thing, it's a different name, of root three is just the angle whose tangent is equal to root three. It's very similar to how exponentials and logs are inverse functions, right? I know that two to the third equals eight, and I know that log base two of eight equals three. So two to the x and log base two of x, equal to g of x, sorry. These are inverse functions because whatever one of them does to an input to get you some output, the other one undoes that, right? If I plug in three here, two to the third is eight. If I plug in eight here, log base two of eight gets me back to three. Oh, excuse me, gets me back to three. And that's exactly what the inverse tangent function is doing. It's, it's taking whatever tangent did to this angle, giving you one and saying, oh, well, if you got one, then the angle was pi over four. So the inverse tangent spits out back the angle that you would have taken tangent of in the first place. Okay, so, yeah. So there's this terrible theorem, in my opinion. It's perfectly fine. It just, it always feels like it's so much to memorize. There's this theorem that says, and gosh, let me see if I did. Did I write it down somewhere? Maybe I did. I have, no, I won't say I've failed to remember it. Oh yeah, there we go, okay. So if, yeah. So it's the same that if you want to take the derivative of the inverse function, it's equal to one over, let me make sure I write this the right way. Yeah, f prime of, and now this is where things get weird. This part here is f inverse of x. Let me try written that correctly because I always get confused with this. I won't lie. Um, yeah, that seems right. Okay. Sorry. So this this is a weird formula to me, but we could use it if we want to find the derivative of our tangent. I'm going to show you a better way in a minute because I think it's something you should see. Even though no, I think it's something you should see. So our function is tangent of x. We're going to need the derivative of tangent. So f prime of x is secant square root of x. And we're also going to need to figure out how to take secant square root of the inverse tangent. And this is where things get really weird. So gosh, I really don't love this. OK, so here, sorry, so Right, this is so, let me write this out. <laughs> so I'm taking the derivative of the inverse tangent, right? So I'm taking, I'm gonna write it this way the derivative of the inverse tangent. That's my f inverse prime. And that's equal to one over f prime, so secant squared, but not of x, it's secant squared of f inverse of x. So it's secant squared of the inverse tangent of x. And then you might ask yourself, how the heck do you get from that to one over one plus x squared? Well, it has to do with triangles. Let me write this a little nicer. 
and he, this is kind of why I spent a minute talking about what inverse tangent is, right? So if I said, you know, well, let me just go back to the side, right? Tangent of an angle equals one, or tangent of this angle equals one means inverse tangent of one equals that angle. So there's this relationship, right? You take tangent of something, you get a number. It's the same as taking the inverse tangent of that number to be an angle. All right, so check this out. I'm going to say over here, this is, kind of, this is kind of the really key part to making this work. If I see that, if I'm talking about inverse tangent of x, well, the inverse tangent of something is going to give you an angle. Right? When I talk about the inverse tangent of, of 1, the answer is an angle. Or the inverse tangent of root 3, the answer is an angle. So whenever, whenever you're taking an inverse tangent or any inverse trig function, the output is always some sort of angle. So when I take the inverse tangent of x, I'm getting some angle. I don't know what it is because I don't know what x is, but I'm going to call it theta. OK, now here's the important thing to know. Right? If inverse tangent of something equals an angle, that's the same as saying tangent of the angle equals that something. So it's equivalent to write, there's that good green pen, that x is equal to tangent of theta. Right? Those things are mean the same thing. There are some domain range restrictions, but we're not really going to worry about that. OK, and now I'm going to do something kind of sneaky. If tangent of theta equals x, well, tangent of theta is really x over 1. OK, let's draw a triangle, um, right? Because I'm saying my angle is theta. It's a right triangle, by the way. And tangent is the opposite over adjacent. So tangent of theta equals x over 1 means x could be the opposite and 1 could be the adjacent. And then I can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out what this third side is here. So that third side, well, if I call it, I don't know, c, 1 squared plus x squared equals c squared. So c is equal to the square root of 1 plus x squared, right? Because 1 squared is 1. OK, finally, check this out. Inverse tangent is theta. So this derivative of inverse tangent is really the, is equal to 1 over secant squared of, well, inverse tangent is theta. But now I can look at this triangle to figure out what secant of theta is. Um, I'm never good with secant. So I would rather write this as, instead of 1 over secant squared, I would write this as cosine squared. Cosine is the adjacent over the hypotenuse. So that's 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. So that's just cosine. I need to square it. And then 1 squared is 1. And the square root of 1 plus x squared squared is 1 plus x squared. So that's actually how we show that the derivative of the inverse tangent is 1 over 1 plus x squared. Now, I still think it's kind of funny to do this. But I suppose the work I would do is pretty much the same, it's just a little bit different. I still want to show you a different way. So let me show you one other way, just because I think it's better. But it sounds like you probably need to memorize this formula because it looks like he's got you. At, eh, he certainly seems to be asking a few questions about it. So let me show you how we really do this. I mean, I'm not going to do anything different, really. I mean, I am. Technically, what I'm doing is the same work, but I feel like to at least maybe it's just me, but that other formula is good. Here's what I'm going to do I want to find the derivative of the inverse tangent of x, which I know we just did. So here's what I'm going to do I'm going to say y equals inverse tangent of x. And then I'm going to take the tangent of both sides, or I'm really just going to rewrite it. That's the same as saying, tangent of y is equal to x. And it's really important that you're OK with this, right? If tangent of an angle equals some number, it's the same as saying the inverse tangent of that number equals that angle. All right, but now here's the trick. We're going to use implicit differentiation to take the derivative of both sides. 
So I know the derivative of tangent of x is secant square root of x, but the derivative of tangent of some stuff is secant squared of the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Oh, but you can't just take the derivative of one side, you have to take the derivative of both sides, and the derivative of x is just one. And look, we're getting back to the same place we're on the other side. I'm getting that my derivative y prime is equal to one over secant squared of y. And then I can say, oh, but tangent of y equal to x means y is my angle, tangent of y equals x over 1, so the opposite is x, the adjacent is 1, my hypotenuse is the square root of 1 plus x squared, and then this is equal to cosine squared of y, which is just 1 over the square root of 1 plus x squared. squared. So this is, at least in my mind, the more normal way of finding the derivative of the inverse tangent by using implicit differentiation like this. But I mean, really, that's what we have done on the other side here. It's just a little different. So that said, um, let's look at a problem similar to problem 10 on your homework. I'm, I'm assuming, although I guess I should ask, are you, have you guys talked about the derivative of the inverse sine? Yes, no, maybe. No, okay, I didn't think so. Um, we probably don't need to, so we won't. But we need to do So let's see. So, yeah. sure. I'm going to make this way more fun. Okay, I mean, not way more fun, but fun enough. Sure. So let's find the line, find the, I assume he means the equation of the line. I, I, I would totally write that too. Find the equation of the line. I feel like if you're being kind of a smart ass, you could be like, oh, I'm going to draw the line. There it is, I found it. Find the equation of the line tangent to, I can't find it again here. If we were talking about a tangent line to a tangent function, it can kind of be confusing, right? We're going to do the tangent line to, um, let's say we're going to do the inverse tangent. So I'm going to make this a little bit harder. Uh, let's say the square root of x yeah, at x equal to 3. And what else do I need? No, that's all I need. Okay. All right, so here is the idea. Equation of the line tangent. We all know what that means. It means find the point and find the slope. Right? Those are the two things we need to find the equation of a tangent line. We already have part of the point, right? So the point, if x equals 3, the y value, well, again, we're on this, this is our function. Um, I should write probably there from f of x equal to, right? Y is going to be f of 3, which is the inverse tangent of the square root of 3. This could end up being an, an, an ugly number, right? If like it was inverse tangent of 5, just be like that's my y value, whatever inverse tangent of 5 is. Here, inverse tangent of root 3 is a well known value. It's pi over something. Is it pi over 6 or is it pi over 3? Everybody's like, oh, I know trig is. So tangent of pi over 3 is equal to the square root of 3, and tangent of pi over 6 is equal to the square root of 3 divided by 3. So the inverse tangent of root 3 is equal to pi over 3. Right? And then that's exactly because tangent of pi over 3 equals the square root of 3. All right, so we've got our point. Our point is 3 comma root pi over 3. Right, that's our point. Now we just need our slope. How do we find the slope? By taking the derivative. And then plugging our point. So the slope here. So I have to take the derivative of the inverse tangent of 
the square root of x, which is going to require the chain rule. Right? I know the derivative of the inverse tangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. The derivative of the inverse tangent of some stuff is 1 over 1 plus the stuff squared times the derivative of the stuff. All right, let's simplify that a little bit. That's going to equal 1 over 1 plus x. All right, that's what 1 over 1 plus squared x squared is. And the derivative of the square root of x, well, this is really x to the 1 half. So the derivative is 1 half x to the negative 1 half. I knew my three was going to come back to bite me in the butt. Oh, well. The numbers are not going to be nice, such as that. Okay, so there's our derivative. Are there questions about this derivative before I move on to the rest? Okay. So then I'm going to plug in 3 to actually find the slope. So I'm going to get, let's see, 1 over 1 plus 3 is 4. Oh, this is a big fraction there. Times 1 half times 3 to the negative 1 half, which is not nice. So I get, let's see, 1 over 8, and then the 3 to the negative half is 1 over 3 to the 1 half, or 1 over the square root of 3. So you get 1 over 8 times the square root of 3. Okay, not my favorite slope ever. But now we have all the information we need, right? We've got a point, we've got a slope, we can write the equation as y minus the y value equal to your slope times x minus the x value. And I definitely would leave it like that for this, but I would not write some up. His problem should be a little bit nicer because his derivative should be, you know, the derivative inverse tangent of x squared should be 1 over 1 plus x squared squared times 2x. Yeah. So right here, there's my 1 half x to the negative 1 half. And that, right, that's the derivative because, sorry, I'm using the chain, right? The, the derivative of the inverse tangent of root x is giving me, well, the inverse tangent of some stuff is 1 over 1 plus the stuff squared. And that's multiplied with the derivative of the stuff, which is the derivative of the square root of x. But the square root of x, right, the square root of x is just x to the 1 half. So the derivative using the power rule is 1 half times x to the negative 1 half. So then, after I found that derivative, I plugged in 3, right, so I'm trying to find the slope at 3. So I plugged in 3, I got 1 over 1 plus 3, which is 1 over 4. And I got a 1 half, right, that's just that. And then I got 3 to the negative 1 half. So 3 to the negative 1 half, sorry, I know I'm right. 3 to the negative 1 half is 1 over 3 to the 1 half, which is 1 over the square root of 3. So I had 1 fourth times 1 half times 1 to the square root of 3, which simplified to 1 over 8 times the square root of 3. So hopefully that, yeah, good. Okay. So that's how you would do this problem. I definitely think you should memorize the derivative of the inverse tangent. Um, yeah. Also, I want to mention, I sent you guys an email. I posted a couple logarithmic differentiation examples that were from another class, but I feel like they're still good examples for this class. So if you, if you have, not that we can't do any of those, but if you have questions about logarithmic differentiation, you want some examples, there are some examples on YouTube. Okay, continuing in this vein, let's look at, I think I wanted to do one similar to problem, I don't remember which one was it was. Yeah, let's look at it. Let's do one similar to number seven. Um, sure. So let's say our function is, uh, what am I going to make it? Sure. 4x cubed plus dx plus 2. Now, his function and my function, he, right, he said his function is invertible. I'm also saying my function is invertible. I don't actually know what the inverse is. But I know it's invertible because it's an increasing function. Right? All of these, oh, um, yeah, yeah. Right? All of these pieces either stay constant or get bigger as the value of x gets bigger. Right? 4x cubed is a function that gets larger and larger and larger as x gets larger. 
EVX is also something that gets larger. So if you have a bunch of functions that are increasing, all added together, it's also increasing. And if you have a function that's always increasing, even if it's been increasing really slow, right? Um, it's got to be invertible because it's one to one. And if you're always increasing, then you're invertible. Now, do you really know this? Uh, maybe a little, but this is, if you didn't know this, you could probably still do the problem just fine. Because he tells you it's invertible. But it is nice to know. If you've got a function that's always increasing or always decreasing, it's invertible. So this is invertible. And I want to find, what do I want to find here? I want to find the derivative of um, f inverse of x at, what do I got here? Oh yeah, I'm, yeah, at seven. Okay, so the point of this problem is not to find the inverse function. Usually it's probably impossible to find the inverse function. Not that one doesn't exist, but it's just really, 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 maybe impossible to calculate what it is. And that's not the idea here. So we're supposed to use the inverse derivative. Right? The theorem says the derivative of the inverse function at some value x is equal to one over the derivative of the original function at f inverse of that value of x. Which feels weird. So I would really want to write this in, right? So no, I mean this is right. Yeah. Okay. So the derivative of this function evaluated at x equals seven equals one over the derivative of this evaluated at f inverse of seven. And so here's the point of this problem. It should be easy to guess what f inverse of seven is. So f inverse of seven bleh, equals what? Well, here's the thing. If f inverse of seven equals some a value, that's equivalent to saying f of a equals 7. So the idea here is you're supposed to go back and look at the original function and go, OK, ooh, I picked, ooh, ooh, I picked wrong. Sorry, I meant to make that 3, not 7. Sorry about that. Sorry, now, now it's a reasonable problem. OK. So the idea here is that we're supposed to be able to look at this function and guess what you can plug in for a, sorry, for x, so, or a, whatever you want to call it. So the f of that is equal to 3. So do you guys have any guesses for what you could plug in for x so that f of x is equal to 3? It's, and it should be like the easiest thing you might be able to guess. There's usually two different things I try. What could I plug in for x and get 3 out? Let's see, if I plug in 1, does it work? f of 1 is 4 plus e plus 2. No, nope, that's not 3. And I think if I go bigger, it's going to get worse. Negative 1, I'm plugging negative 1. Let's see, I get negative 4 plus, ah, see, e to the negative 1 is problematic, right? e to the negative 1 isn't nice. It's not going to give me an integer value. What's kind of the only power of e that's really easy to kind of deal with? Yeah, 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 exactly. So the thing is, if this is supposed to equal some nice number, you can only really try the values of x that are going to make e to the x nice. And if we look at here, f of 0 is definitely 4 times 0 plus e to the 0 plus 2, which is 0 plus 1 plus 2, which is 3. So f of 0 is 3, which means f inverse of 3 is equal to 0. So here's the idea. Oops. Yeah. 
We're gonna just say, okay, I'm gonna take the derivative, I'm gonna take one over f prime, right, the original function, evaluating the f inverse of three, which is gonna be just zero. So they have to take the derivative. The derivative of this function here is, let's see, f prime of x is 12x squared. Oh, I actually made it more interesting. Oh, well, he definitely made his problem a little bit more smarter than mine. Sorry. Plus e to the x plus zero. So I plug in zero here, I get zero plus one plus zero. So I get one over one, which is one. So that's the idea for problem seven, right? The idea is you're going to do one over f prime of some number, but the number that you're plugging in there isn't the derivative evaluated at, I'm um, sorry, four, it's the derivative evaluated at the inverse function of four. And if you look at problem seven, I think you could all probably guess what f inverse of four is, right? If f of x is x squared plus three x plus four, what can you plug in for x to get four out? Exactly, right? You guys are already there, right? So I know that in this problem, right, this is the homework problem, I know that f of zero equals four, so I know that f inverse of four is equal to zero. So when you do his problem, it's gonna be the same as mine practically, except the derivative, you're gonna be calculating one over f prime of zero. You just have to find, you have to find f prime using the function he has there, which is x cubed plus three equals four. So that's kind of the gist of this inverse derivative theorem thing. Um, it's a little bit funky. It's not the worst thing ever, but it is not my favorite. Um, yeah. the, 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 the thing we use it for more often than just like calculating the derivatives of inverse function at some point is we really do use it to find the derivatives of all the inverse trig functions, as well as people also use it to find the derivative of either the exponential or the logarithmic function. Okay. So let me do an exponential different, or sorry, a logarithmic differentiation. I'm running out of water. Okay. So let's say. I want to find the derivative of, what's going to, what's going to be interesting? Sure, secant of x to the x. So here's the thing. If you see something like this, where you have something with a power, and both the base and the power have a variable, we know we need to use logarithmic differentiation. And the first thing you have to do to be able to do this is you need to write an equation. Right? You can't just say secant x to the x, you have to have y equal to secant of x to the x. And the reason you need that is so then you can take the natural log of both sides. If you don't have a y here, you can't just take the natural log of the other side because you're changing things. So I'm gonna take the natural log of both sides. And the reason for taking the natural log of both sides is when you take the natural log of something to a power, that power gets to travel down to the front of the natural log, right? We get this. So really this becomes the natural log of y equals x times the natural log of secant of x. And once you've done those two steps, then you can differentiate both sides. All right. What's the derivative of the natural log of y? Anybody? Anybody? I'll tell you, it's not just one over y, it's one over y times what? Yes, awesome, great. Okay, and that's always gonna be true, right? Whenever you take the natural log of both sides and you have the natural log of y, when you take the derivative of the natural log of y, you get one over y times y prime. Right? It's just the implicit differentiation. Right? We're saying, in fact, it's we're not even saying it is very clear that y is a function of x, right? Y is equal to secant of x to the x. 
So when I differentiate this natural log of this function of x, I get 1 over that function of x times the derivative of that function of x. And on the other side, we're going to have to use the product rule. I'm going to get 1 times the, sorry, the derivative of x, which is 1, times this left alone, plus x times the derivative of the natural log of secant of x. Just like over here, we had the derivative of the natural log of some stuff was 1 over the stuff times the derivative of the stuff. Here, the derivative of the natural log of some stuff is 1 over the stuff times the derivative of that stuff. And the derivative of secant x is secant x tangent x. And now we're almost done. We have to solve for y prime. So I multiply both sides by y. So y prime equals y times all of that. Which I can simplify a little bit. 1 times this is just this. My e's always look like c's. And here I can cancel one of these secants, right? x times 1 over secant times secant times tangent. Those secants cancel and just get x times tangent of x. And even though this is right, it's not completely right because I have to rewrite it as a function of x, right? My derivative here, since my original function was a function of x, my derivative should only be in terms of x. So I should really write this as y prime equal to, well, let's see, right? y is secant of x to the x. So I get y prime equal to secant of x, come on, James, to the x times all of this. And that's how we do a problem like that with log logarithmic differentiation. Other questions? Um, here's the attendance again one more time. Also, not that, it, not that it matters really, but I think I noticed that I don't think anybody did the weekly participation points last week. It's okay, but I just want to make sure you guys didn't just completely forget about that. So, or if there was maybe an issue with it. Nobody emailed me or asked me anything. So I'm assuming you guys are just like, yeah, I didn't feel like that week, which is totally okay. But I just want to make sure you guys do know that it is something you are supposed to do every week. It's certainly okay to miss a week. I wouldn't worry about it if I were you. I just wanted to remind you that it is something to do weekly. All right, let me do one more problem. Um, I'm going to do one similar to number five. And here's the thing about number five. Once you know what it's asking for, it's super straightforward. So number five says, and I'm going to change it up, so let's see. Suppose that, suppose that y is a function of x. So y is a function of x such that dy dx is equal to negative 5y, right? Yeah. And suppose, and suppose y equals, I don't know, 6,000 when x equals 0. Is the x not t? Seems like an interesting choice, but okay, whatever. So, is that misinformation? No, I guess it is. Okay, yeah. Sure. So here's the idea. With this, we are supposed to be able to write down what the uh, model for exponential growth or decay is. So here's the thing, right? When you see dy dx equals negative 5y, you should immediately think, okay, now nah, there's no one here. We know that y is equal to c e to the k t, um, k x, I guess, in this case. Where, well, the k value is this value here. And the c value is your initial value. So if you're told that you have 6,000 whatever, is it y 6,000 when x is 0, you can either just say c is 6,000, or we could actually plug in, right? So I say, okay, x is 0 and y is 6,000. If 6,000 equals c e to the negative 5 times 0, well, negative 5 times 0 is 0, e to the 0 is 1, 
C times one is C, so I get C equals 6,000. So the model for this, with solving for C and K, is Y equal to 6,000 E to the negative 5X. And I do want to point out, because I think this is important, this really is a solution to this differential equation. If I take the derivative here, dy dx, well, let's see, the constant hangs out, and the derivative e to the stuff is e to the stuff times the derivative of the stuff, which is negative 5. So check this out, and we're almost done. This part right here, that is y. So my dy dx is negative 5 times y, which is exactly the equation started with. So, Whenever you see this differential equation, where it's dy or y prime, if it's dy dx or y prime equal to something times y, you always say, oh, it's just going to be an exponential growth or decay, and it's y equals c e to the whatever that coefficient is times x. So if you see this, you should automatically know it's going to be this. All right, that's all we've got for today. Um, make sure you fill out the attendance. Make sure you have a good weekend, and I will see you guys on. Monday. All right. Oh, okay. I'm um, sorry that I, yeah, I will. Oh, okay. Sorry, that was a private message, but um, yeah. Um, cool. All right. I'm going to end it.